15 more seconds until it's officially 12.30. <laughs> if you don't mind, I think we'll get started early. So my name is Annie Allison. I'm with Hughes Media Law Group. We're a boutique law firm based in Seattle, Washington, and we work with uh, many of the industry's top global, uh, excuse me, top uh, mobile app game publishers and developers. And we are excited to have all of you here today. And we are very excited to hear from Dr. J. Allison Bryant and Paul Levine of Play Science. And they are going to um, give us a really great overview of um, some research that Play oh, Science has put together. Um, I don't know if all of you have a copy of this handy. Um, I think there's some up front. If you need them, just raise your hand and we'll, we'll uh, bring those back to you. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Allison and Paul. Thank you very much. Um, so obviously I'm Allison, that's Paul, just in case you're wondering. Um, so wanted to look into what's happening in the, the mobile app space and really the mobile play space when it comes to kids and families. Obviously there's lots of data and insights that are out there, but we rarely tend to focus on what exactly is being played by kids. There's a lot of conjecture, um, but we wanted to get the actual data around that and then dive, dive a little bit deeper and find out more about you know, things like decision making, purchasing, um, issues around preferences for different types of apps, different kinds of uh, features that girls or boys or different ages might like. So that's really what we're going to be doing. It's very much the highlight presentation. Obviously, we've only got about 20 minutes here today. Um, as she mentioned, we've got copies of the report. That in and of itself is like a second set of expanded highlights, and there's a lot more where that came from. We had a really nice sample for this study, so there's lots of ways that we can break the data by age and gender and all sorts of different stuff. So if people are interested in additional data cuts um, or insights from it, we're more than happy to talk to you guys afterwards. All right, so let's just jump in. So as Allison just um, said, uh, you know, this, um, uh, we looked at um, look, um, we looked at key features flavors, learning, uh, preferences, and triggers. And the focus here wasn't on games per se, but it was on playful apps, right? So people are sort of asking the question, well, what's a game now, right? What's a game, what's an ebook, what's a service, right? So we wanted to kind of take a swipe, a swipe at that, right? So talking to kids, 16 or 14, um, you know, one of the biggest things is extremely high engagement across the board for all ages, boys and girls. Almost half are playing their favorite playful apps daily, and 85% a few times weekly. So blow that out a little more in the broader market, and only a few social apps like Instagram for tweens and teens, and some of the top OTT services show anywhere near this level of mobile engagement, right? So um, you know we think that games as a means of reaching and engaging kids and families is going to grow as a top focus and strategy for big companies and small companies, for-profits, non-profits, et cetera. Um, uh, you know, one of the things we looked at looking at this by gender is, um, uh, is that the top play apps were very similar across gender, right? Boys, as you can see, tend to skew a little bit more action. You've got Clash of Clans and Star Wars. Girls tend to skew even a little bit more casual, if you will, and they enjoy character storytelling and learning right at the core, right? But there's still a lot of similarities, and from a development point of view, that's something good to know, right? Um, then we kind of broke this down by ages, right? And again, this is talking to kids, right? This isn't about what makes the most money or the most downloads, which can sometimes be a vanity metric or any of that stuff. We're talking to kids, right? And again, we found a lot of consistency across ages as well. But with that said, and we kind of think this is really interesting, it's a key point, is that for younger kids, mobile play, from their point of view, remember, right, is really becoming a mix of gaming, playful learning, and kids' OTT, right, with storytelling and IP weaved into that, right? Um, our company is privileged to a great deal of work um, here, and, um, you know, um, and, and we are definitely seeing, with brands big and small, a juxtaposition of play, watch, and learn happening, including with a move to paid subscription services, right? So we think that that's a trend that is going to grow, right? So this is sort of like a really interesting take, and then when the kids get older, it's less of that, and it's more pure kind of gaming, if you will. So now another lens that we used as we were looking at this was looking at some of the educational factors, both 
from a parental side, but also from a kid side and what they consider to be learning. Um, so for parents, education is the paramount value for parents for apps in general, but also when it comes to actually purchase and what they were willing to pay for. So whether you're just messaging that there's education or you're really showing that you have education sort of built throughout, that's going to be critical for parents. Um, well, the things that they consider to be educational, the sort of hierarchy for parents right now, um, and again, this is US focused and we know that this can change a little bit depending on markets um, based on work we've done in the past, but apps that focus on academic skills still really come out um, as the number one thing for parents. But then the things like imagination and creativity we've been seeing on the rise the past couple of years, things that start to move into the 21st century skills, you know, and keeping in mind, again, we're talking about 6 to 14, so we've got a good swath of elementary in there, which is a part, we think, probably why we are seeing a little bit more of those harder skills um, in imagination and creativity. Things like social skills and imagination do start to decline a little bit as the kids get older, so you start to see a little bit of that trend. Now, interestingly, we asked the kids also about, you know, what apps do they like to use when they want to learn something? And that's important because that's the way that we phrased it. We didn't ask them about educational apps because one of the things we wanted to sort of get at was the fact that at least qualitatively in our work, we've been seeing this idea of, you know, what's educational and what's learning really being a bit of a mishmash, right? Um, and how both kids and, and parents are finding it and also what teachers are using in the classroom. Minecraft, of course, being a really great example of that, something that's been sort of co-opted for an educational um, you know, use. Now, what's fascinating to us is the check marks here are, and this is just the top 10 that came up on the kids learning list, four of those top 10 are things that showed up in the overall top 10 list, right? And even more interesting for us is you have things like Minecraft Angry Birds and Trivia Crack showing up as what kids are considering to be learning, right? Now, for our perspective, we do a lot of work in play and learning and playful learning as well. We really think about things across the spectrum. We're looking at the way that learning um, is being integrating into apps. And so we're going to give you a quick look into that spectrum, um, very brief overview of what this is. And I don't want to dive too deep into this because this is a really big um, underpinning of a lot of the work that we do. Um, but basically, on, on the far left side, you have what we call directed learning, right? This is very, um, I don't want to say flashcardy, right? But you get it. You know, it's like, here, what is the question? Here's the answer. I might give you some supporting information after that, right? So it's very directed. And on the very far end of that, you have fully open learning, which is, um, let's say, the extreme sandbox play, right? Where there's kind of no rules and you can kind of do whatever you want to, right? What's interesting is that those more traditional apps, um, plus trivia crack, that were on that top 10 list, most of these are really further on the left-hand side, right? They're relatively directed, they're not particularly open, which is becoming more best practice when you start to look at games and things, particularly in areas like 21st century skill or STEM or that kind of thing. What's interesting is that those more, you know, I think we would call more traditional entertainment apps, things like Angry Birds or even a Minecraft, actually have a lot of potential. They're a little further over on the open potential learning side of things. So I think it opens up a lot of possibilities as we're thinking as developers. First of all, it certainly is validating that you can have apps that are really engaging and fun and playful and can, you know, obviously do quite well in the marketplace, um, even be you know, purchased by very large companies, um, but that they also can have some learning value. So we feel like there's a lot of things to look at. In right. And the other thing to note is once again, this is a kid's point of view, right? Nick Jr. and Watts Disney, they think that they're having fun with them, but they're also learning with them, right? And a lot of these OTT apps, right, these and Play Kids and the other more specialized ones, have definitely moved to integrating games. It's play, watch, and learn. So again, it's a data point, right? So for big brands, there's something there, but you know, um, everyone can kind of look at this and see where things are going. Okay, so on the platform, oh, okay. so on the platform preferences, um, Tablets rule, okay? Tablets are by far the digital toy of choice for both kids and parents, right? Um, you know, 45% um, if they have them, kids, you know, want to kind of play their games or their playful apps on a tablet, right? Now, this is something that we looked at too, right? From a parental point of view and a kid point of view, looking across the ages, right? When kids are toddlers, right? The top two things that they want are tablets, but those are kid-specific tablets. Something happened on the thing and it's not showing them, right? Think Navi and Leapfrog, right? And then right under that, right, 
are regular tablets and then e-readers and smartphones, right? And when you look at kids, it's 48 to 44, right? Even for young kids, it's pretty close. So they want, you know, something that looks like a leap pad or just a regular tablet. And what we found, we've been tracking this, is somewhere around four or five years old. Kids are like, you know, I don't want to play with that anymore. Right? I want a regular tablet to play with, right? And possibly it's because, you know, as many of you know, kids are aspirational, and if they've been playing with a leap pad or a knobby when they're three years old and then they're five or six, that's a baby toy to them, right? So there are some real implications here for toy companies, for, you know, and, and you know, and um, so um, the other thing is um, when you look at tablets and you look at smartphones, parents view them very differently. Right? There's a very positive halo effect around tablets and a decidedly negative one for smartphones. Again, this is the data, this is how they feel, right? And most likely, um, even though you can get social media um, you know, on each, you know, smartphones are seen as more, you know, you know, frankly, just you know, not educational, not safe, and not good. It's something to think about because as you're developing at this age, Kids are involved in the choice, but parents are pushing the button. So when you're making platform choices, where do you go across platform? How do you, you know? How do you spend your time and your money? What's above the line and below the line? This is something to kind of think about. So another thing we dove into with kids was for them, what makes a great app? What are those features that sort of rise to the top when they're looking to either choose an app or and we did sort of an open-ended exercise with them where we said, hey, what if you could create your ideal app? What would that include, right, to get a thought? What we found is that, and we, what we did was we went back and sort of roughly color coded some of these things to, because the budget have a nice long big chart, into different categories like personalization, achievement, <coughs> media, IP, and social. And what's interesting to us is, first of all, it's not like any of those categories win, right? So thanks kids, we want it all, right, yeah. is basically what they're saying. But the most important things, ability to create your own avatar, obviously if that's a relevant thing, super important for again, kids, again, this is 6 to 14. Points and rewards, which is an achievement metric thing. Sound effects and music are really important for them. And that was a little bit higher than I think we were necessarily thinking. So for those of you guys in that, those departments, I'm sure you're excited. Um, action games, and I'll show you a little, there's a little differentiation between boys and girls when it comes to action games, as Paul alluded to earlier. Um, but also things like ability to create your own story. I mean, that's number five on this list. So again, this idea, avatars and stories. So in the top five, you've got two things. They're not just personalization, but they have a lot to do with, we call it kid-generated content, right? Sort of inputting themselves into the experience, right? So we're definitely seeing this generation of kids wanting more of that kind of interaction with apps. And again, this is kids saying what they want to see in the app, right? So it's extremely... Um, kid trip. Now, one of the other things we asked about was about the people they play with in this area of co-play, because that's something that we've been hearing, um, or certainly all of us in the room, been thinking a lot about and are seeing a little bit more of in the marketplace. And what was interesting is that although almost 70% of kids said that they really prefer to play alone, 30%, and we're almost talking almost a third, are saying that their preference for playing with their favorite app is to play with somebody else, primarily with friends or siblings, um, but also with their parents. And what was interesting is we went back and we looked at those apps that were showing up in the top 10 or the top 10 across the gender and the age and all that, so maybe let's say top 20-ish apps, was that there aren't really many kid-friendly co-play um, mechanisms that are put in there, right? So if you think about the way that kids play and you, you think about sort of intuitive play patterns that you see if you watch kids play all the time, which is what we do in our daily life, um, you know, the ones that are there, it's things like MMOs and asynchronous turn-taking. Well, those are the things that don't actually work for kids. So as we're thinking about what could this mean possibly if you're wanting to look at co-play um, in the kids' space, three things came up to us, again, as we've been watching kids playing with these devices and also playing with other, um, other platforms. So one is the idea of, of course, same device turn-taking. You do see this in some of the board game apps, things like Yahtzee, where you have same device turn-taking, but you're not really seeing a lot of that in kid-focused. Apps. This idea that you could have the same device, you could take it back and forth, that is what they're doing when they're playing nicely with each other, uh, right? Is they are sort of passing it back and forth, but that's not, that doesn't tend to get built into the mechanics and the mechanisms of achievement and rewards inside of a game for kids. Um, we also have same device co play. Um, again, this is obviously much more for a tablet than it would be for a smartphone because of the, the size of the screen. Um, and you know, a great example of that is Williamsburg. 
um, which came from Node Press Interactive, where you actually, you don't necessarily know that you need to be playing um, with multiple players, but you kind of realize over time that you can't put the mustache and the hats on the cats um, unless you happen to be playing with somebody else. You should download it, it's a fun one. Um, then the other piece is multi-device synchronous play. So we're seeing that in households with kids, we're having a real proliferation of devices. This is across the board, across all demographics. We're starting to see this. And so the idea of being able to play with my tablet and your tablet or you know, my Amazon Kindle and your LeapPad or whatever it happens to be, the fact that we might have two devices in the house where we can play at the same time is becoming the kind of play pattern that we're seeing kids want to do. And again, they're playing the same game, we're sitting right next to each other, right? So how do we figure out how to crack that and do multiple devices uh, synchronous play? And then, so bringing it back to the first point though, is even if you have that, even if you're designing for co-play, the reality is there's always the times where kids are by themselves and they want to kind of play by themselves. So being able to design for co-play, but with a great single player experience built in, kind of gets you the best of both worlds in that. And the last area we want to look at is gender's role in play. Um, and this is an area that um, we found some unexpected findings, which has been consistent with a lot of the research we've been doing, having some unexpected gender findings recently. Um, the first is if we look at what kids are wanting when it comes to their favorite features and, um, and apps. So in their ideal playful app, boys want action and avatars, right? I mean, girls also want avatars, but boys slightly more. And girls want characters and narrative, right? So that's just generally speaking a little bit about the differentiation. Now what's interesting again is you still see a lot of the same top apps showing up for both genders, but if you're looking at what they prefer or even what is compelling within the same app for them, right? So take something like a Minecraft, right? Where it has a lot of dimensions. For boys it might be the action the avatars and the girls it might be more character and narrative. And narrative can also include sort of narrative that they put around uh, the story itself. When we look at parents, we see that gender we're seeing some interesting trends around here about how parents um, are viewing the gender of their child as impacting technology. So in this study, what we found was it was things like the 30% more likely to let boys choose their own apps. They're 13% more likely to pay for an app for their son. And then when it comes on the flip side, that for girls, they're more focused on apps that have academic skills for their girls. So they're more focused on putting the education piece into apps that they're downloading and buying for their girls. So there's something going on, and this is very much in line with research that we did about six months ago that looks specifically at um, parents' platform preferences. <coughs> um, and this is just a quick overview of what we found there. So again, you see for girls, it's they want it, it's safer, right? They want child friendliness. They want, um, they're more likely to prefer a child's tablet for a girl than for a boy, right? That has the safety features that's more inherently educational or learning based. And then for boys, it's the child's preference for which platform they're going to be able to, whether it's a smartphone or it's a tablet. Same thing, boys' preference for apps, same kind of thing. And then parents are three times more likely to favor a smartphone or a video game device for their son compared to a girl. So again, sort of permissiveness um, for boys and a little bit more um, of a watchfulness for girls and a focus on education. So some kind of dynamic there that we're uncovering. Um, so I think we're now at times for, uh, for questions if anyone's got any. And obviously you guys have the full, well, the full report without all the data cuts um, with you as well. Did you guys look at the details of, oh, sorry, of, of purchase? with kids and uh, really how, how a household dynamic works around the purchase uh, premium versus free to play. We got a little bit into that. We didn't do the full deep dive into like literally what are the steps into purchase and decision making, but we do have, and I think a lot of it is in the report just about like where are they finding out about things, who is making decisions, um, and, and how does that align between parents, kids, or both when they're doing decision making, so there's a little bit in there. Um, we didn't do like a full step-by-step -step analysis in this particular yeah, I mean, and we've looked at that for games, but um, uh, we've also looked at that for um, you know, um, uh, OTT services as well, right? Because again, 
from toy companies to media companies to independent game developers to everyone in the ecosystem that's trying to figure out how to actually build a profitable, sustainable business, right? Because even Tokoboka, after many years, is only doing X amount of net profit in a company that judges net profit in the nine figures, right? You know, everyone's sort of trying to figure this out, and we're seeing all of this converge, right? So if you're building a platform to have a subscription service, and you know that video or short, long or short form is going to be part of it, but so are games, and you know that games and learning are, are kind of going together, and you're sort of serving this direct-to-consumer, depending on your market, right? How do you sort of use this to think about what you develop, the type of characters and media and content, and then how do you market that? How do you message that, right? And you know, it's fun because you're putting the pieces of a puzzle together, right? But on those kind of things, we do sort of have a lot of that information. So we can kind of talk afterwards. Scott. Hi, Allison. Hi, Paul. Thank you. Great presentation. I have three questions for you. The first being, is your report available online for others to see? It will be. It will be up on the Casual Game site. And just grab our card if you want a copy of the PDF. Great. Uh, second question is, uh, what was the sample size and when was the survey conducted? It was conducted in June 2015 and it was 1,355 kids. It maps back to national demographics and technographics based on the past three big kid studies that are in 6 to 14s. Online, phone calls, how were the questionnaires? It was all online. Okay. And last question, I'm curious about some of the products that were mentioned. It makes me wonder, which carries more weight, the strength of the brand or the interest in the app? Any thoughts on that? Well, or how much marketing money have they been putting in recently? Which yeah, I think exactly. is one of the big ones that comes up when you look yeah. at the education slide. Uh, yeah, no, look, I think that's a, I think that's a big question we need to dive a little bit more into because I think particularly knowing Snapchat time and knowing um, you know where a lot of marketing was being pushed, we were seeing a lot of that clearly show up, uh, like I said, in the educational one in particular. Um, that was also, well, not just education, I mean, actually in the top 10, I think as well, if you could look at like, the voice list, there was a lot of things that, that we've been seeing a lot of marketing in mainstream media about. Um, that said, there are also some things that show up that I've literally, and I work in this space, I've never seen in my entire life, and I, and I work there, but they're sort of having that emergent growth. So I do think there's something there, particularly in niche areas, you notice Bible for Kids shows up, I'm not saying Bible is a niche. Please, you know, but that's not something necessarily that you're seeing a lot of you know ads for. But there's clearly a group, um, a very large group in this particular case, that is sort of promoting that internally and sort of going viral. Yeah, and the one thing you know we looked at this because you know marketing can do a lot, right? So if you're pushing a couple million dollars kind of marketing an app and you're doing boost campaigns and all those other things, you're going to see results. But you know, I think when you look over the last couple of years, the point is is that characters and IP and storytelling, they matter, right? But even going back years ago to Alma, right? And, and any great creative team can come up with something like that, where the goal isn't to sort of then go to MIP and try to kind of get it on Nickelodeon or Noggin or PBS, right? But, but we're seeing that you want to invest the time to have, if you can, to have great characters and a great story if you're not a quiz base app or something like that, and if you want to have legs, right? Um, but that certainly doesn't have to come from the biggest brands. Now, they're leveraging that, um, but you know, there's millions and millions of incredibly creative people out in the world who know how to create characters and brands, so it's really anyone's game. And that's what you see in that top 10 list, right? It's primarily those smaller, smaller brands. Okay, I think we've got another question. Was your survey across the U.S. or worldwide? Yes, it was U.S. only. It was 100, I don't know if you were here, it was 1,355 parents and then their kids as well. And one last question, how can you guys pass the mic off? <clears throat> you mentioned marketing, I just have a question about um, when you do, when, you know, when, you do, when the companies with these products market uh, for, for, on, on the platform, are they marketing to the users of the product, the kids, or are they marketing to, to the parents? Well, 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 look, if a company is actually doing marketing, right, that's not just organic because right from the trenches, oh, we know the folks at Apple and Google, and that's our marketing strategy, right? Um, you know, it, look, it's a combination, right? Purchasing decisions, kids are involved in purchasing decisions, absolutely. Parents play more of a lead role, especially for the younger kids. Parents need to see something healthy, right? You know, um, something educational, right? Something good, right? I'm not giving you a Mountain Dew, 
I'm giving you, you know, something else which is going to be good for you, right? Once they get past that hurdle, then the kids want it to be fun, 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 right? But again, so we've seen a lot of that, right? Where it's finding a balance act, but, but, but if you have a great game and the kids will love it, but it never gets downloaded because you ignored parents, and not just moms, but dads too, we've got other research on that, right? Then they might never see it. Right? Unless they're seeing it, like ABC Mouse, right? you know, and it's marketed on TV all the time, it might rise above the fray, but not every app developer has seven figures to kind of do those TV ad lines. And I think, I think the key also is, um, if you're marketing directly to children, let's say you have a, a very directed kids learning app, obviously, well, first of all, kids are not afraid to learn. They're kind of okay with learning apps. I mean, they don't want them all the time, just like want that all the time, um, but they're okay with that. But if you can find a way to message the fact that there is some educational or learning value to the kid, because it's the kid that's going to parrot it back to the parent in sort of a, you know, good way, that's really a, that's really a good way to approach it. Okay. Everybody round of applause for playtime. Thanks, guys. Thank you.